You're listening to the Wonder Lusting Wives podcast, your podcast for escaping life's monotony, indulging in your wildest travel fantasies, and discovering the constant beauty of this ever-changing world. On today's episode, we have special guest James Hammond joining us to share about his journey through Oman and Jordan. Welcome to the Wonder Lusting Wives podcast. We are your navigators, Allison and Regan. Welcome to another week of the Wander Lusting Wives podcast, another Travel Tuesday coming right at you. Um, for those of you who might have been here in season two, uh, we are still calling this Travel Tuesday, uh, even though we do not have Wildcard Wednesdays anymore. But uh, we just love the idea that every other Tuesday you're going to be getting an episode um, that has some really great new content. And we've been having some amazing guests already. We have an amazing guest lined up for you today. We're really excited to jump into our conversation and get some new destinations in the mix here. Uh, But before we get going on that, I do want to give Allie just a quick second to plug our social media. Same as uh, the past couple seasons, but Instagram is at Wonderlusting Wives, Twitter at Wonderlust Wives, and then Facebook, Wonderlusting Wives Podcast. Um, We also have a Gmail, which is really great if you'd like to reach out to us. That is wonderlustingwives at gmail.com. So without further ado, we have our wonderful guest, James Hammond, with us today from the Wayne It Travel podcast. So welcome, James. We are so excited to have you. Regan, Ali, how are you doing? Great to be on the show and very privileged. I know you guys. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited for the chat. Yeah, we're so excited to have you here and we love your podcast. So tell us a little bit about your podcast. Where can our Um, listeners find you on social media, on your podcast, give us like a brief little synopsis of what they can expect from your podcast. Yeah, podcast is Winging It Travel podcast, all about travel, but long format, I think is fair to say. So my podcast interviews are probably hour and a half to two hours. So they're fairly long. So if you're you're a short form uh, sort of podcast uh, audience type person, then it's not for you. Um, but yeah, for a long, long format, interview people every week or every other week. I'm trying to play with a new format at the minute. So it's about people's travel stories, travel lifestyle, travel philosophies. Uh, I speak to different people like uh, yourselves, like podcasters, travel podcasters, or uh, digital nomads, full-time travelers, uh, I guess like authors, journalists. So yeah, extreme travelers. So I kind of cover an eclectic rate of traveler. And yeah, it's just about casual anecdotes stories tips and having fun it's probably the best way to describe it i think that's what's so great about podcasting is that it is it's just fun like you're ma- you're making content for people who also want that content you know like people there's podcasts for everybody which is what's so cool about it and if it's a long form or if it's a short form there's something for everybody so i think that's really cool what you're doing and trying different things out and whatnot but uh uh, I just kind of want to get started with um, just a little bit about you and your travel background a little bit, your travel philosophy, just like why is travel important to you? Ah, oh, good question. So yeah, back in the day, so I'm going to go back a bit, probably 13, 14 years ago, if you like, 2010, I was doing my degree in music. So I have a degree in music, believe it or not. And halfway through, I was like full on music. I'm going to be a musician. And then halfway through that, I had a bit of a change of heart and I went to Australia to watch cricket. So I know Americans don't like cricket because it's too long. I get it. It's five days. I understand. <laughs> but I love cricket. So I went to watch cricket in Australia with a couple of my friends and I couldn't believe Australia as a place existed. So then I spoke to a random guy in the audience like in, in front of us who's watching the cricket. He's Australian, but his dad is from England. And he was telling me, oh, yeah, you can get a work permit out here and live here for one or two years. I was like, oh, wow. So I took that back with me. And then from that moment on, I think I always knew that I was going to finish my degree, save as much money as I can by working. And then I went on my worldwide trip for two years, which was January 2020, no, 2013, literally 10 years ago, um, almost today or 11 years ago. Wow. So, yeah, that was like the big, the big trip with uh, like Asia. Australia and South America in two years. So that kind of kicked off the the wanderlust. And I guess back in the early 20s, more hedonistic travel, much more partying and stuff. But now 10 years later, it's a bit different, a bit older, a bit slower and a bit more wise, I think. So I'm a bit more of a, a worldly traveler now, I think. 
Um, okay, so you got um, into travel because you went to Australia and cricket and all that stuff. And then you realized, okay, I really like this whole traveling thing. So where did traveling take you after Australia? Uh, yeah, so I came back after Australia and that trip thinking that I need to get like a career. I guess that was my mindset. And I kind of got a job what, that I thought I liked. And then I quickly realized that wasn't for me. So then I just saved some more money again and went to India in 2016 for three months and then came back, probably had the same thought process, uh, you know, some relationship stuff, all that sort of stuff going on. And then I met my current partner in 2016. Yes, I think that's right, but I'm getting trouble. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we decided quite early on, even though it was like quite a new relationship that she would like to travel as well. And so would I again. So we agreed to go to New Zealand on a work permit to work. And that was like an incorporated trip of Asia, New Zealand, and a bit more Asia afterwards. And then that kind of led us to in Canada, because when you get to your early 30s, your work permit age gets to quite a critical stage. You can't get work permits past 35 or 31, depending on where you're from. So Canada was the last time. So we committed to Canada, came to Canada here, then COVID happened, and then we quit our jobs pretty much a year ago and went on a year trip last year. So that's kind of the full circle of a decade, if you like. And we're here now back in Vancouver a year later. So yeah, I guess that's kind of like a brief summary of, of the trips. There's been a few other trips in between there, but they're the main points. Yeah, for everybody uh, who's never heard from James before, James has done a lot of traveling, been to a lot of countries, has a lot going on. Definitely check out his podcast, hear from him, hear from his awesome guests. Um, you will not be disappointed. So um, I would like to now jump into a couple of the specific destinations that you've been to that mm -hmm. I don't know that a lot of people have been to. So I'm excited to get some some new uh, content here, I, I suppose you could call it. Um I would love to start. You said that you've been to Jordan and Oman, and I would just like to yeah. kind of hear uh, to start. Like, what did what did that trip look like? Like the who, what, when, where, why of that trip? Yeah, so Middle East is obviously an interesting topic. Off the bat, mm -hmm. I'm sure we're we're fully aware with stuff going on now. Um, but some of the safer or easier countries to travel to are places like Oman. And Jordan, Jordan especially is like the the very how can I put it? Uh, I won't say startup pack to Middle East, but it's a it's a nice way to ease in. So you could go there on a road trip, or go with a tour group, or even travel on your own. It's totally fine. They're a bit more uh, used to tourists there. And Oman was a bit of an unknown, but they have great roads, and it's a really cheap gas because they obviously produce the gas. So both trips were road trips essentially. Uh, the difference between the two was going to be Jordan was going to be uh, we've got all these sites to see like Petra and Wadi Rum and all the desert stuff that was going to be staying in hostels or guest houses and driving whereas Oman the idea which we'll come to in a minute was to wild camp or boondock if you're American because um, it's allowed in the country you can literally stay anywhere in the in like the wadis or in the mountains or by the beach whatever you can camp wherever you like so that was kind of the premise of those two countries wow i don't know if i would be brave enough to do that <laughs> i just think <laughs> um i am not a huge like just camp wherever so <laughs> or boondock wherever um so especially mm. in like a country that i wasn't familiar with i would feel maybe uneasy so what was that like did you ever mm. feel like nervous or unsafe or was it a pretty safe experience so Jordan's a very safe experience. Like I would recommend people to get a car out. Uh, they drive on the same side as you guys, or Canadians as well. Uh, for UK, it's the other side. Um, but they, because they were part of, like, you know, the British Empire was included in, in Jordan, unfortunately. So they do speak English. So all the signs are in English. And all the tour guides or even all the people at the airport, uh, hotels, they all speak English. So Jordan is a great start to... The Middle East and the roads are pretty good. Not as good as Oman, but they're, they're decent. So for Jordan, it was easier because we're booking hotels and hostels and guest houses. And you can do it on booking.com, Expedia. You can even turn up uh, on Google, whatever. You can ring them, you get a SIM card. 
Um, so it's pretty easy to navigate around, and we based it on the sites. So Wadi Rum in the south, uh, Akaba in the south by the Red Sea, the Dead Sea. So you can float in the Dead Sea in Jordan, which we did, which a weird experience. And then you can go mm -hmm. to Petra, which is pretty, pretty incredible if you can get there. Uh, any advice for Petra would be get the two-day pass and make sure you go before 8.30 a.m. because all the tour buses arrive and they pack the place out. But if you go before that, you get no one there and you get the full picture of of, um, of the treasury at the Petra. So Jordan was an amazing trip. Uh, not too expensive, but slightly expensive. If you compare the currencies, it's quite a strong currency. And it's an easy way to go around. Restaurants are easy. Now, the caveat for us is that we went during Ramadan. So it made it slightly trickier. Um, but that only means you can't find places to eat during the day. Maybe occasionally you might find like some hotels with like, a license to um but otherwise during ramadan you got to accept that cafes are closed for pretty much all day so sunrise mm -hmm. and sunset um yeah. apart from petra petra is open for food because they, they cater to tourists um and then <laughs> yeah oman was uh well so wild camp in oman is an interesting one right because the rule is you can sleep anywhere and we went in may just before summer now straight off the bat too hot way too hot um 30, 35 degrees, went down to maybe 20 in the night. So we had our car and our tent. And it's eerie because no one's camping this time of year because it's just a little bit too hot and there's no one about. It is a strange feeling. Totally safe, but eerie. Um, hmm. And Amani nationals are really nice. They'll help you. They can speak English as well. And also, they don't mind people camping as long as you clear up, uh, respect the rules. Um, so the beach is incredible. The mountain's incredible. The oasis in the middle of the deserts are incredible. And Muscat is the place you'd land to to get your, your hire car. So, yeah, not really too much planning pre-trip. Just arrived, got the car, looked at the uh, the best things to see and do and drove there for uh, 10 to 14 days on both countries, really. Uh, Jordan was easier because they have more sites to see. And Amman is bigger, so you have to factor that in. Yeah. So... I, I actually have a question about mm. uh, being there in Ramadan. Yeah. Like, because of the timing, were you able to uh, be a witness to or be involved in any of the, like, cultural celebrations or anything, like, that was happening during that time? Or did you not see too much of that? So the best thing to do culturally if you want to get involved is put yourself in for a iftar. Yeah. So... What I would advise people to do is book a restaurant that has iftar, which basically means when the sunset hits, they're going to have this huge buffet of food. So vegan as well. Vegan is fine. There's loads of salads, uh, like Middle Eastern foods. There's loads of meats. And the cultural experience will come. They have a big TV in the restaurant. And they normally watch like a service on there where I guess the the Muslim cleric will give the, the word to say, yep, it's fine. It's end of the day. And then as soon as he like, bangs his gong and says something everyone like gets straight up to the queue and gets their food so i guess that's quite a nice cultural thing and maybe i'd advise people if you're western is let them go first because they haven't eaten all day uh, you can probably still find food like occasionally like i said in hotels but just bear in mind these guys have fasted for the whole day so let them go first in the queue and don't worry there's loads of food so that's kind of the i think the experience we got was from the the restaurants like just that iftar at the end getting set up and then people gathering, singing songs and stuff like that. Yeah. That's awesome. What I'm imagining is like Black Friday, everyone's just like hoarding the, the buffet. I'm sure it's much more civilized than that. Um, but what was yeah. the food like? Was there anything that like you really enjoyed particularly or was really strange that you ate? The food is like baba ganoush and hummus and roasted meats. I run the barbecue, like barbecued roasted meats. Uh, I, unfortunately, I'm intolerant to chickpeas and lentils, so I couldn't have that side of stuff, like falafel as well. I'm not, I can't really eat falafel, so lots of falafel stuff if you're into that. Uh, loads of salads, like I'm talking like couscous as well. And it's just a plethora of food. Like you, you wouldn't believe how much they cook. Um, and it probably costs, like in terms of cost, even though it costs probably about $10, maybe 15 US. You could probably get um, in that figure. In, in town so yeah and it's all you can eat so you pay one fee mm. and you just go up and have as much as you want and lots of dessert, dessert as well ice cream all that sort of stuff 
just bear in mind there'd be no pork, obviously, for being a Muslim country. Well, you had me at ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> lots of yogurts as well. Lots of yogurts. They love, love their yogurts. <sighs> yeah. 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 That sounds yeah. fantastic. Uh, yeah. Love that. Um, so my, so you talked about how you stayed in like hostels, um, pr- primarily like that, that kind of accommodation when you were in Jordan and mm. then, uh, this very, very interesting form of accommodation to me in Oman. So I would, I kind of want to hear what came from that? Like, what did you learn from that kind of like wild and what did you say it was called again? Wild camping. Wild camping. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, of course. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what did you what did you learn from that? Are you an avid camper to begin with? So you kind of knew what to expect? Or like, what was that like? So we are campers for sure. But there's there's a caveat to this. In Oman, they have no facilities. So mm. yes, they can they can tell you while camping. And it is true. You can sleep on the beach. You can sleep in the in the mountains. But then you've got to think the second question is, oh, how do we like facilitate going to the toilet? So, <laughs> <laughs> Kind of important. <laughs> yeah. So that, we didn't think of this really. But the first lesson we learned on the first night by the beach, nice like wind from the beach, just about too hot, but cool enough in the evening, is that when you want to go for a toilet, um, to get too graphic here, obviously it's not always a wee, right? So the, the other part is not a wee. You're going to have to dig yourself a hole in the sand and squat and do it and then cover it up because there's no other choice where <laughs> where else do you go <laughs> yeah yeah if, if you're in a car and like you've got a jeep if you're in a camper van if they uh, i'm sure you can rent those out you probably have a toilet in the camper van in the camper right in the rv but if you're if you're in a jeep or a car and you've got a tent and there's no facilities you're gonna have to figure out and be comfortable with going like real like earthy nature calls like go into the bush find somewhere sit down squat we got to do do it clean it up and then obviously carry anything with you that's like i guess toilet paper or toilet roll right so yeah Yeah. these were the lessons we learned early doors but the problem that wasn't really a problem for us the problem was it's too hot Mm -hmm. Uh, and out of the 10 night uh seven nights we planned to do wild camping i think we'd done four in in the tent and then three in guest houses because it's too hot yeah yeah. Well, that's that's amazing that you at least like you tried it, <laughs> like like you went for it. <laughs> yeah. That that's such a cool, unique experience, including that part about like when nature calls, <laughs> what do you do? Um, but I'm just picturing that moment in the Pixar movie Up, where the little kid is like, "Do you dig the hole before or after?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's before. <laughs> like, you just find out, you know. It's just wherever. Yeah, you learn these things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. And Allie, the I, the vans in Iceland, the pooper yes. vans. Yeah, because <laughs> they just be a good be a good visitor. I guess is also a, yes. a, a lesson that comes out of this too. But uh, yeah. But That's Oman, right. for example, though they have loads. They got a great coffee scene. I didn't notice until I went there. Ooh. So you can find great cafes with coffee with aircon and obviously a normal toilet. So. We use that to our advantage where the place we're going to, if we like, if we just hang on, drive like two hours to the next town or whatever, because we had a SIM card. SIM cards are really cheap there, great signal mm-hmm. everywhere. Um, you can find the next cafe, sit in aircon, sort of like chill out, go to the proper toilet. Uh, of course, people are thinking, well, how do you shower? Well, we had like a um, like a manual shower, pump shower. So you fill the, the bucket up with water and then you have a pump on your foot. And you hold it, so you're pumping your foot, and the shower comes up. You can even rest oh, it against the car or against a like a branch, and it feels like a shower. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, you can pump pump shower yourself. That that's fine. Uh, I would be aware if you're a woman that, and also a male as well, that don't get totally naked. It's not technically like legal, so make sure you probably mm-hmm. wear swimming shorts or something like that, yeah. um, or a swimming costume. But yeah, that's how we kept sort of clean for the week. Uh, yeah. But as I said, we went to guest houses in between, so I had a proper shower. But uh, yeah, a lot of lessons learned. I think that the, the interesting moment is when we camped on the beach on Mazira Island in the south, and we saw turtle marks on the sand. Uh, they're green turtles, so they're quite rare, and you don't see them very often. They're huge. We saw one. They're huge. Um, they come out from the ocean, lay their eggs, and they go back in during the night. 
And I think it was like, I don't know, 10 feet from our tent, like really close. Um, but we didn't know, obviously you don't hear them in the night, but that, that's quite weird to think that this creature was coming towards our tent. Um, oh my yeah. gosh. And I mean, Pretty a turtle, cool. you think like, oh, turtles. But when it's a huge turtle. <laughs> Green turtle, yeah, they're huge. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's incredible though, especially to see something so rare, like, or like be in the presence of something so rare. I don't know. That's just like a cool energy. <laughs> yeah, you can go to a place called Al Rins, uh, Jas Al Rins, um, J-A-S-A-L-R-I-N-Z. They have a, a protected area where you can do a tour to see it in the night and um, they don't touch them like it's very it is ethical like they just protect the area and keep you from a safe distance and when they share they shine red lights not white light so red light doesn't affect the turtle so you can see these mm. turtles just like digging their holes but they let the eggs in um so when we saw that i was like wow these these things are huge they're like unbelievably big <laughs> so yeah oh my in, in, incredible nature and there's camels as well just roaming across the the road so just beware that when you're driving in Oman because they just cross the road. <laughs> so yeah, there's camels about as well. Well, yeah. Have you had any other wildlife encounters or there's not much wildlife? I know you're camping. So when I think of camping, I think of like, you know, a bunch of animals, but Oman I'm sure is much different mm. uh, land than what I would be camping in and like at the middle of the forest. So <laughs> what were some oh, yeah, of like yeah. any of the other wildlife encounters that you had, if you had any? Uh, we had like her like hermit crabs. They're not even that um, dangerous. They're, they're really small. You think they're like the, the shells, don't you? But actually they start moving. Uh, mm -hmm. So hermit crabs. And they have them um, you know, on, on Missouri Island. I don't even know what crabs they are, but they're bigger crabs. Probably yeah. like like big like across your hand. Uh, I don't know if they would come up to your tent, but I wouldn't want them snipping away you. So they were quite big. And if you go to the beach, you can sort of see them just coming in out of the sea. And, and we had... Yeah, camels. We saw flamingos, but we didn't. They didn't encounter us. We just drove past them. We didn't expect that. Hmm. Uh, that was a Missouri Island. But other than that, I think Jordan and Oman was just camels, uh, no, and and some wild dogs. They quite a few wild dogs about, but nothing hmm. extreme. Just camels running across the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fine. yeah, an yeah. ordinary yeah. day. <laughs> I'll send you some pictures. Yeah, you can have awesome. a look. That's quite funny. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we video, love that. video of them crossing. Yeah, yeah, yeah amazing. So, but Oman, Oman's got great roads. It's cheap petrol. They all speak English. Muscat is an easy place to be. Uh, great hotels if you want to do it that way. Um, but you can also rent a jeep out and go and drive and welcome mm. anywhere you want. So yeah, it's a great country to check out, and it's huge. So give yourself a bit of time. That's fantastic. So a trip like this, like, how did you pack for the trip? Because you also said like. You had this shower contraption. So how did you research and plan and pack for a trip like this? Yeah, great question. So we, we arrived with our backpack, um, but I found out for another traveler uh, in Amman that there's a guy, a British guy who lives in Muscat called Chris Nomad. He's not, his Nomad's not his name, but his, his name is company. So Chris Nomad, put that in Google. And he has all these types of equipment. So you can rent Jeeps from him cars uh, tenting equipment um all just like packaged together so it fits in your car so we picked up from in muscat went for a week uh came back after a week and drop it off to him so yeah it's just a fixed price you you, you rent this stuff off him um he puts you in a whatsapp group of other travelers in Amman, so you know to ask questions if you're like oh can i stay here what's this place like is anyone jumping on the ferry or going to this place. Um, yeah, so that there's a WhatsApp group where you connect with fellow travelers for that week. Um, so we had a few contacts just in case we need to ask questions. So yeah, he's a great guy and he, he'll get you sorted out if you need anything to camp with. Uh, yeah, there's also, if you don't go May, if you went like now, where it's like peak season, there's so many travelers there. So I would book in advance um, because mm -hmm. now is peak season because it's not too hot. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would not want to be hot. <laughs> like, like I'm just so interested in. Yeah, yeah. And it's I have so many people. That's the only time they can travel. So now I'm like, okay, as I plan my travel for the rest of my life, I got to work this in in January at some point. Um, yeah. So my my next question, I guess, would be like, 
so what were the things to do? Was it mostly like the the nature of it all or were there those things to do? What were the highlights from that aspect? Yeah, so highlights were what I said before, Ras Al Jins. So go to the Green Turtle Sanctuary, uh, pay for a tour. Uh, great guys down there. And you can there's a hostel or guest house just outside the gates. It's quite cheap. Uh, I think he knocked some money off for me because he knew Chris. So like, if, you, if you know Chris, you seem to get money off these places. So um, <laughs> just, just to tell me you know Chris. So yeah, that was a highlight, seeing the Green Turtle. Uh, we went to a place called Bimar Sinkhole. So B-I-M-M-A-H, Sinkhole. Uh, it's easy to get to. It's right by the sea and it's free. All all things in Oman are free, everywhere, apart from the, the tour for the Green Turtle. So Bimar Sinkhole is just the huge like little... Not little, it's like a big hole right next to the sea, but it's like a little oasis because there's, there's, there's like a little pond in there, and you can just go and swim. And it's like warm water, um, mostly westerners, so you can jump in with bathing suit is fine. You can park up and just chill out in this like really like idyllic water for like an hour or two. Um, that was a highlight. Uh, Muscat as a city is is a great place to go and check out their their big mosque. Mosque, should I say? Um, I think it's called Jabus. I can't remember the name of the big mosque, but big mosque in, in Muscat. And we walked there and it's free to get in, but you do need to cover up shoulders and knees um, for male and female. But yeah, that's free and that's an amazing architecture. And in Muscat, they have huge malls, shopping malls. So if you need a bit of westernized food or aircon, they're great to go to. And then we went to the south to Mazira Island, which is like, go into and imagine like the Maldives with the beaches there because the beach is incredible. It's like that white sands, blue water. Uh, you get the ferry to there from the mainland. Um, the ferry is very cheap, like seven or eight dollars for the car. Um, it's a bit chaotic. There's no like rules. You just drive on and just park on. But uh, as long as you've got a ticket, you're fine. Uh, or if you're a foot passenger, just walk on. So Missouri Island is great. You can camp on the beach or stay in a few mm-hmm. guest houses there. Uh, I think that's pretty much Oman, I'd say. And then we went to, you can go to the mountains, the Jebel Shams. Um, and we went to Wadi Khalid, which is like an oasis in the middle of the country. So yeah, lo- lots of swimming in hot weather in these like oasis places where it's like desert for miles and then you suddenly see some trees and then it's like, oh, the palm trees and there's like a bit of water there and there's probably a couple of calves uh, to have a coffee or an iced coffee and go and do a nice little swim. And overall, the coffee scene in Oman was amazing. Like Nizwa mm. in the middle is like a historic city, Nizwa. And that was 40 degrees, so that was quite hot. But they have like lots of forts there you can go and check out. And they, they are paid, unfortunately, uh, but not too much. So, yeah, go and check out some forts and have some amazing coffee. There's one mm. cafe I want to recommend. It's in Bala. So you go to Bala, B-A-H-L-A, go to the fort. And next to that fort, pretty much, is a coffee place called Kadam. So it's K-A-D-M. And it's like you get your own little room in this, like, souk. You walk down the souk, turn right, own little room, the door. They bring your coffee to you. you got this, like, little exclusive Middle Eastern room. <laughs> it's so nice. Um, so, yeah. That sounds amazing. Yeah. It sounds like, like <laughs> everything I want. <laughs> give me a room. Give me the coffee. It's going to be yeah. good. <laughs> Aircon. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I have a question on the coffee. How does it differ? Like, what made it so good? God, that's a great question. Because we we found a few in Muscat that were okay. So off the bat, when we arrived, it's like, oh, it's okay. But when you start going out to little towns and little coastal towns or, like, cities like Nizwa and places like this or Mazira Island, you've got a lot of um, expats that are there, whether like Filipino or um, there's quite a few from China as well, uh, even middle, other Middle Eastern countries. Uh, there's a few Indian and Pakistanis there. They're setting up cafes with like proper espresso machines and then they just import a coffee from Middle East. So there's a couple of cafes that have Imani roasted coffee. So I guess that's just local coffee. And there's uh, other places like from Saudi Arabia that have their coffee. That seems to be really good. Um, but they brew it like a western coffee so it's just a, it's got that sort of like european vibe to it a little bit but uh just great taste in espresso coffee couldn't tell you any specifics really but it's some of it was local some of it was not but if it wasn't local it's still middle eastern so 
Um, yeah. I think my next YouTube video, I'm going to do like top five Omani cafes to visit. So uh, I think that's my next bit of content. I will be watching that probably <laughs> at, at least Give three times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. But, but I think uh, I think Jordan is easy to travel to in terms of sites because they have lots of Roman ruins, um, lots of castles and lots of forts and lots of like the desert stuff. Uh, and it's a bit more akin to tourists. So you can um, arrive them and it's a bit easier to arrange and, and plan out. I think it's a bit more um, sort of tourist based, if you like. And mine's a bit more rustic. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah. What is that like? I'm trying to think of how to phrase this question. So it's it's similar to like if if you're in Rome at the Colosseum or like something mm. like this that you read about in a textbook or something like that you mm. you learn as you're growing up or in your own discovery that uh like that there's these places that are so key to history and whatnot. So what was it like to be at some of these places, Petra included? Petra's like the one that mm. I would know of. Like, what is it like to be? at a place like that, like the feast for the senses. What is that? It's, I tell you what, the, the day one, so Petra day one, we went midday and it's heaving with tourists. Mm. So I must say we, we done some walks. It was a hot day. I liked it, but I didn't love it because it was just too busy. So then next day two, we're like, no, we're going to go at like 6.30 a.m. when it opens and we're going to go there before all the tourists arrive. We only stayed five minute drive from the uh, from the guest house. You park your car, and when you walk around those, like it's quite hard to explain, but it's all within rocks. So it's all wavy rocks like this, and you you're weaving in and out, and it's like cool because the the sun doesn't come through yet. But when you walk round towards the treasury and you see Petra, the, the, the main treasury there, the main site that everyone sees, and there's no one there apart from a few camels. I just can't explain. It was definitely a highlight. It's a bit cliche because people are like, oh, Petra, blah, blah, blah. But before the tourists arrive, if you can get there and just soak up that like early morning sunrise feel. Mm. Even the Bedouins who like sell stuff are not even there yet. Like it's just the best time to go. So just make the effort to go early for sunrise um, when it opens up and you won't be disappointed. It, it's hard to explain the smell of the nature there because you're not infested with people. It's just like it's coming off the, yeah. <laughs> coming off the structure of the walls. It's a little different. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's just incredible. And you can carry on to Petra has like, I think it's five kilometers walk all the way down to the end of the main road. Like it's a main road, like a main path. But off this path is like different treks up to different parts of the, of the whole area. And you can choose to do like two or three of those in one day, but you could probably spend a week or two weeks there is that big. So, yeah, we chose like a monastery and we chose the, the treasury and we found this little calf on top of the hill, which walked up from the monastery, a bit of a trek up, but it looked down on the treasury and it's like this guy, this Bedouin's got this like little calf there, probably fits 10 people. You sit on the floor, you get your picture with the treasury down, like you get probably about 200 meters up. Um, yeah, that's an incredible view. That's, that's pretty unrivaled. Uh, he, he's got to go in there, you know, like it's a hot day. People walk up, they need a drink. So he has a like cold cans of Coke or you can get tea there as well, or coffee, whatever you want. And then just sit there and admire the view. And you can't see many tourists because you're that high up that the angle is just the treasury. So you might see a few camels. Um, but other than that, yeah, like you can't see many people. So that's like a top tip. Um, so go all the way back to the monastery and up and you're going to see Petra from a height. So yeah, pretty cool. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah. I would get the Jordan Pass as a tip as well. So the Jordan Pass is 75 US dollars and it includes your visa fee and entry to everything in Jordan. Wow. Including Petra, but just make sure you add on the second day in Petra so you get two days there. If you don't want to do it in a day, it's too rushed. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a great tip. Just get to just arrange that before time and take that with you. Yeah. yeah, that's really good information. And speaking of tips, do you have any other like trips for Jordan or Oman? I know you said you did a lot of the driving on your own, but should people expect there to be public transportation to rely on? Should you just be better off driving yourself? Mm. What are some other tips that you have if someone wants to visit Jordan or Oman? So Jordan has buses, so you could bus it, uh, coach it. Uh, I would, I'm not sure how reliable they are, but they're, they're quite well connected. So I would 
if, it, if you're not comfortable with driving, I think the bus system would be an option, but you're going to have to give that some time and be flexible, I'd imagine. Um, but they will go between the main cities, which is enough for Jordan. Like You can see a lot of stuff. Um, Oman? No. You can fly into Oman? No, you, you're going to have to drive it if you want to see the country. There's no other option, really. Um, you can maybe carpool with a few travellers if you find some, but even Muscat walking around, like, it's not a walking place. Mm. <laughs> like, people just drive everywhere. It's a bit like some places in the US where people just drive all the time. So Muscat and Oman it, as a whole is a driving place, yeah. Uh, a lot of people just get Jeeps and, and drive around. And there's certain rules in Oman. So certain mountain passes require you to have a 4x4. Four four. So you need to make sure if you're planning your route, like to Jebel Shams, which is like a mountain range, get a, get a four by four because they won't allow you through with a two by four. So just mm. bear that in mind. Yeah, that's good to know. And also, yeah. I would totally go for the four by four. That sounds so fun. Um, but yeah, we had two by four. So next time, four by oh, four. Oh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> put it on a bucket list or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I really want to hear like, and I'm kind of gonna wrap two questions into one just just for time, the sake of time. Yeah. But part one is, did you meet any individuals or, or like uh, people along the way that you got interesting stories or lasting relationships from? And part two would be kind of just the generalized version of that question. What are some of those stories or memories that came from uh, these trips to Jordan and Oman? So I would probably say that in Oman, we probably connected well, interestingly well, with the owner of a desert camp in Wahiba Sands. So Wahiba Sands in Oman is definitely worth seeing. It's expensive, so you're going to have to pay for it. But uh, the essentially, essentially, the trip is the Omani sort of camp owner, if you like. He picks you up and he drives you through the desert and you stay at this camp in the middle of the desert, middle of nowhere. And he was talking to us about his life and how COVID was a tough time because the government did not help Omani people. They kind mm -hmm. of said, you got to de deal with it yourself, like if you're losing business. So he was explaining that like his business took a bit of a hit, but then he's slowly recovering a few years later. So he studied, he studied in England at university. Now, Omani's dressed in that long white like robe type thing with the, the head crown thing on the top, like the red and white sort of like, it's like a scarf thing, right? It goes around the top. So my question was like, oh, did you dress like that in England? Uh, I don't think he did. I think he just dressed a bit more casually. But in Oman, they dressed very traditionally. So that guy was a nice guy. Um, so we got to chat with him with a cup of tea. He offered some fruit and tea. And we sat in his like tent in, in the middle of the desert and had a chat with him. And I met on that tour two other people from Belgium. And they were like funny people, the older, hmm. like, mid 50s. They were teachers, I think. Well, no, one was a teacher, one was a doctor. And yeah, he still messaged me. Like he can't speak English that well. Uh, the teacher guy, he's called Glaude. And, uh, but he likes taking his students to the Middle East for like trips about history. So sometimes he asks, ah, oh, is this place safe to go? I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know from a kid's perspective. Um, <laughs> but he keeps <laughs> asking me these questions, but he's a nice guy. So we talk about the, um, the tour that we did and we've done some sand bashing on that tour. I don't know if you know sand bashing, but. Uh, they take you in a jeep, and they sort of like drive up these dunes like really fast and up like like angles like that. So like up and down. So we've done some of that. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. And then in Jordan, I think I remember speaking to the owner of a cafe because I love their coffee. It's called the Why Not Cafe. It's just outside the airport in Jordan. So the capital of Jordan is Amman, not Oman. Amman, oh. uh, A M M A N. And just outside the airport, there's a cafe called Why Not Cafe, and they serve a really good espresso coffee. So I had a like, chat with them and talked about travels and they're, they're very nice people there. So yeah, I tried to like make lasting impressions with like, especially with the coffee owners, because I had a coffee podcast at the time. So I tried to like, give them a few stickers, introduce myself. Um, yeah, probably like the cafe owners, I probably can remember the most. And that they just like made us feel so welcome. It's probably the best thing I can describe is about making sure you're okay. Do you want another coffee or any help with what's to see next. Um, so I think those cafe owners, especially in Oman, were quite special. Yeah, I enjoyed that. And also Chris Nomad in Muscat and Oman. 
Uh, I can send you the details if you want to put it on any like blogs you do or anything you like. But yeah, I think he's a great guy to be in contact with. Uh, he has WhatsApp. He can ask answer any questions. He's been there for 20 years. Um, and you get added to a WhatsApp group with other travelers. So like people can help you out in a month. So yeah, uh, just, the, just the guest owners as well, the guest house owners in Jordan, all very nice. Um, so yeah, just the hospitality is a second to none. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. And that's not the first time I've heard that about countries in the Middle East there. Um, mm. So I think we have a, a narrative to rewrite a little bit. And I mean, you know, it, there, there, there's lots happening in the Middle East right now also. Yeah. So it's it's also really great. To, I mean, there's still humans over there, you know, so it's like yeah. it's it's nice to hear stories like these. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we have just had an amazing time talking to you about Jordan and Oman, and we're just about uh, ready to wrap up our episode. But before we do that, we do want to do our travel blitz segment with you. Um, So we are going to give you a question or a topic and you give us the quick answer that pops into your head. (laughs) And that's as much as you're getting. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I'll let Allie kick us off for a travel blitz with James Hammond. All right, number one, what is your number one travel tip or hack for just traveling in general? I would say in the modern day age, get a SIM card. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Local SIM card, yeah. Yeah. Okay, question number two. Top three destinations that you have been to? Uh, Bolivia. Japan, Nepal. Hmm. Ellie, I you know all share Bolivia one. is one of my <laughs> top as well. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Question number three: What are to- uh, three top destinations that you want to go to? So Bhutan this year is going to happen, and Sri Lanka is going to happen this year, and then the third one would probably be. Columbia. Mm, very fun. All right. Question number four. What's the strangest thing you've eaten while traveling? Uh, strangest, strangest slash disgusting. Probably. Oh, I've got two answers, really. I'll, I'll give you. Can I give you two answers? Sure. <laughs> sure. Why not? Okay. First answer is I went to Ukraine a long time ago in 2012 before all the trouble was now. And we went to a local wedding, got invited. Don't know how that happened. <laughs> and as, as a welcome gift, they gave me pork fat. Grim. Mm. Um, so that's the grimmest thing I, th- I think I've nice. eaten. And of course, Koh San Road in, in Bangkok, I've eaten a scorpion when I was a bit, bit drunk. Um, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> bit, no, bit salty. Very salty, yeah. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I guess our last question on that note, <laughs> um, the top thing you can't travel out, obviously, besides like a toothbrush or, you know, the essentials, what's something you can't travel without? God, that's a great question. Right now, as a traveler today, it will have to be my noise cancelling headphones. Mm, that's a I'm good not a big one. fan of like walking around new places with the headphones on. I mean, just if you're in hostels or like you're on a flight or a train, you just need to or do a bit of podcast work. They're, they're key just to focus for could be five or 10 minutes or an hour. I think they're key these days. That's yeah. a really good one. Ooh, that's such a good answer. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Well, James, we have had a great time chatting with you on today's episode. Thank you so much for fun. sharing with us. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I really enjoy myself. I, I think you, know, you guys are doing great things. So really honored to come on and uh i look forward to hopefully you guys come on my podcast and learn more about you guys and see what your your thoughts are about travel where you've been and yeah reciprocate the interview that'd be great yeah we would Sounds love that great. and make sure you follow uh james's podcast on social media winging it travel podcast and check them out wherever you listen to your podcast you will not be disappointed thanks guys thanks for tuning in to the wonder lusting wives podcast Come escape with us again every other Tuesday for Travel Tuesdays. Don't forget to give us a subscribe and a follow on all of our social media and wherever you listen to your podcasts. And until next time, wander on.